Yeah. Uh, welcome everybody to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the seventh meeting of 2015. Can I ask everyone to set their electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please? I'd like to start with introductions this morning. We're supported at the table by the clerk and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office. And welcome to the Observer in the Public Gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. And I'm going to ask members and witnesses to now introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. And for witnesses, can you please restrict your introduction just to your name and organisation, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Sandra White, MSP, Glasgow Kelvin, Deputy Convener. Laura Alcock Ferguson um, from the Campaign to End Loneliness. Good morning. I'm Danny Boyle, Parliamentary Policy Officer with BMIS Scotland. Uh, John Mason, I'm MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. I'm Grace Cardozo from Dumfries and Galloway LGBT+. I'm Alison Love from Royal Voluntary Service. Annabel Goldie, member of the Parliament of the West of Scotland. Sheila Fletcher from Community Transport Association. Natalie McFadden White from Impact Arts. Christian Allard, MSP for the North East. Karen Nicholl from the Aberdeenshire Signposting Project. Jenny Ridge from a T. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Liz Watson, Befriending Networks. I'm Jane Baxter, MSP for Miss Scotland and Fife. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is an evidence session on our inquiry into age and social isolation. In fact, it's a typing error. It's actually agenda item one. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I apologise, it's my fault this morning. The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. <coughs> Members are asked to agree to take in private <coughs> item four, which is consideration of our approach to the wraith, ethnicity and employment inquiry. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Now, agenda item two is an evidence session on our inquiry into age and social isolation. If witnesses or members wish to speak during this discussion, can you please indicate to either myself or my clerk in my, my left, Elsa? We're restricted for time today, and you appreciate we've got a really high number of witnesses. I'll do my best to ensure that people are given the opportunity to speak. And can I also ask you to keep your answers as focused as possible so we can get around to as many people as possible? And I'll begin the questions this morning. Um, can I ask uh, the witnesses what you have found to be the impact of social isolation and loneliness amongst older people, and is there an impact of social is the impact of social isolation actually understood in the third sector and amongst service providers such as health and social work services? It's a good start to the morning, that isn't it? Who would like to ask answer first? Well, I just pick somebody, Karen. Yes. Um, I, I think, from our perspective, I think that there are two very definite impacts on physical health and mental health with isolation and loneliness. Um, we find that third sector and statutory sector referrers are very good at picking up on the the impact um, and and noticing it and taking steps to do something about it, whether it's referring into us or referring into someone else. But we find with an awful lot of our cases, um, 208 of 282 cases in 13 and 14 were identified as isolation or social contact issues by the referrer, referring the client into the project. So I think certainly from our perspective, it is being picked up. I would certainly agree that there are serious health impacts of both loneliness and isolation. Um, uh, loneliness has been um, equated, loneliness and isolation has been equated to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and um, being worse for us than obesity. There are links between cyclical and negative links between depression and loneliness and isolation. Um, and um, increased risk of um, dementia, 64%. Um, um, more likely to um, develop dementia. There are, and, and that is something that the Campaign to End Loneliness has really been emphasising amongst um, statutory bodies, particularly in England. And I would say that um, even after three years of work on that with a number of partners in England, 
we don't feel that enough is being done there. Um, at last count, about half of the local authorities had prioritised this issue um, within their health and wellbeing board strategies. So we definitely, um, and we focused on England partly because we've got three members of staff. So when we started four years ago, we had to narrow down. Um, but we would definitely recommend um, a local authority leadership role for this issue. That said, we shouldn't forget the personal impacts um, and, the, and the community impacts. Not, it's not just about health, health impacts. Um, and so there are other um, problems that can be caused by this issue um, that need to be unpicked in order to solve it as well. Anybody else? Jenny? Um, certainly from my point of view, and our um, organisation, ACIT, is Computer Training for the Older Person, and we've been running since 2001. Um, so from my point of view, we have more of a, a positive sign that learning computers and the use of the internet in older people has enhanced their, their quality of life and their mental and health and well-being because the more information and knowledge that they have mental stimulation keeps pe people going so we from our po point of view it's very much a positive sign but I agree that there is um, issues that we have with another project um, that we run which is Moose in the Hoose project whereby we go into care homes um, and our team of volunteers that help older people in residents engage um, using Skype and that sort of thing. And so, again, it's a positive in, in, impact. Um, Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, convener. I'd agree with my colleagues about the uh, impacts that they've described uh, for older people um, in terms of loneliness. I think also we, we mustn't forget the impact um, that loneliness has on our uh, health and social care services and the cost um, financially of, of loneliness when uh, all of these long-term conditions, uh, mental health problems, etc., um, are meaning that older people are relying more on, on services. So that's an important point. Um, I think that um, certainly there's uh, people are beginning to understand um, that uh, loneliness is one of the major public health concerns now for, for older people. I think from our perspective, though, um, what um, statutory and voluntary services don't fully appreciate is that older people come in more shapes and sizes than just older. And for our, our population group, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender older people, um, there is a complete lack of understanding across all sectors um, and a complete lack of visibility and acknowledgement, actually, that uh, LGBT older people are, are, um, are out there in a, within our communities. And where the intersection between... Uh, age, rurality, LGBT, ethnicity, where the interse intersections lie, um, are sometimes places where more of a, a risk lies for social isolation. Natalie? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, just carrying on from what I suppose everyone said, and through Craft Cafe, there is an obvious reduction in um, medication for depression. There's an increase in quality of life. But I think what's important about the third sector approach through the Craft Cafe approach is it's open to all, so it's not for just people with existing conditions, it is a preventative approach and it's about that community coming together and supporting one another. Um, so that I think is quite a key value of where the third sector can, can fit within older people. Thank you. Um, can we, I know there's quite a lot of people want to come in, but we're really working to a tight timescale. We're going to move on now to our next set of questions. If we've got any time at the end, we can come back to maybe issues that you want to actually bring up that actually hasn't been covered. Um, and we'll move on now to John Mason. Okay, I think I'll ask, uh, I've got kind of three points, but I'll ask them in two, two bits, if that's OK. So I'll ask uh, the first one first. Uh, and I mean, somewhat, I think, ho hopefully this is going to follow on and overlap with what's already uh, been said in other sections coming up. But my kind of theme is about how to reach people and both that means, do, do people know, uh, people who are isolated and lonely, do they know about services in their area? Because there might be services in the area, but they're not connecting with them. Or do they know about them? And there's a, an issue with transport, say, uh, that they, how do they actually engage with these services? Or is it the biggest problem that the services just aren't there at all? Uh, can we bring Liz, then Karen and Sheila? services across Scotland, we're the umbrella body that supports befriending services across Scotland. Um, our information really, generally speaking, is that it's not that potential service users are unaware of such services, it's that because befriending services are, generally speaking, underfunded and overstretched, there is such a long waiting list, um, potentially. So, 
although the services are out there, they're always they're patchwork, they're piecemeal, um, they're not always in the areas you know of, of greatest need, um, and all of them have, most of them have really long waiting lists. The, the same posting project exists to link people to services, organisations and groups in their local area, which will be of benefit to them. And the thing that we find quite often is that people are very unaware of the services that are available to them in their local areas, partly because they don't know how to find out about them, um, and, and particularly with older people, if they may be not too um, IT literate and they don't know how to use the net to search for things. But also because services and, and groups kind of erupt and then disappear and things change and the people that you would contact have moved on. And it can be very, very difficult for people to know where to go and then to negotiate the barriers. Transport is an issue that we see on a constant basis. We can find things for people, but we can't necessarily get them there if there are any mobility issues or they're reliant on public transport. Um, and I think that's the same for a lot of rural areas in Scotland. But... The, 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 there's, there's always been a kind of an idea of this magic database which will contain all the information about all the local services and groups. The minute it's written, it's out of date. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we find is that it's a constant updating process. And people tend to come to us when either the thing that they were planning on going to they find out doesn't exist anymore or they don't know where to go to start. Um, a perfect example would be a local camera club that we were trying to get someone to access. We contacted the local library and they gave us the contact details. It turned out that camera club had folded 15 years previously. But <laughs> So that it's that kind of thing that, that, that we, we are constantly coming up against on a day-to-day on a -day basis of actually finding things. And there's a very piecemeal approach to some services as well. They'll be available in one town, but not in another. And that might involve a, a trip of maybe 60 miles or, or more for someone who, who desperately wants to access something. And There's at least two issues in there. One, that some services are patchy, yeah. but also just that... For whether they're there or not, people actually don't even know. Yeah. I mean, have you got any suggestions as to how we can, can get over that information bit? Um, I, mean, that, I mean, that's what that's our bread and butter, that's what we do. Um, and we work a lot with other organisations. We, we, we don't just take to referrals for clients. If an organisation is to contact us and ask us if we know of something that exists for a client or a patient of theirs, we'll give them that information um, ourselves. And is your kind of service available nationally or is that purely it's locally? It's purely Aberdeenshire. It covers the whole right. of Aberdeenshire. So that service is not there elsewhere? There are, there are variations on the theme popping up all over Scotland, um, but the service that we are providing is, is only available in Aberdeenshire. Sure. Light to come in now. Yes, I, I'm from the transport side of things, so um, one of the biggest issues we have is short-term funding. Um, we know that the benefits of people travelling, even on the bus, are significant. They build up social networks with the people they travel with to various different things. We've had a big loss in Highland of lunch clubs. I think it's happened across the piece, and they're being rebranded as wellbeing centres run by communities. Again, short-term funding for these is really making it problematic to keep going sometimes. Um, and really, transport is the biggest issue. We've uh, Transport Scotland have just carried out a consultant's report, which was issued yesterday. 89% of the people responded said that they were fairly or very, they find community transport fairly or very important in getting to social activities. So the, the people that are using community transport really value it, and 50% of the people have no alternative. That's not forgetting that there are vast areas of Scotland that don't have any transport provision at all, and we realise that there's a lot of isolation in these areas. Uh, Laura would like to come in and then Jane, a supplementary. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to shed some light on um, people who weren't aware of services. Um, when we asked back in 2011 whether um, older people were aware of any services that could help them if they were to become lonely, 42% um, of them said they weren't aware. That's despite us actually reaching those people through service organisations. Um, so, so you're saying it might be worse than that because there's other people you're not even aware of? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, other people who may not be being reached. Um, and subsequent um, surveys with GPs 
which you'd think, um, you know, GPs do have um, a higher number of um, visits from older people and they've, um, a number of them anecdotally have said that they think that um, visitors, uh, older people are visiting them um, primarily because they're lonely and not for, for health reasons. Um, around 50% of them said that they don't have the tools necessary to help and to be able to refer on, so they wouldn't know where to... Um, to refer on for help and organisations themselves might not actually be reaching out again back in 2011 we asked um, um, over 100 organisations how they actually identify and reach out to those who are lonely um, and that's the, the lack of response has led us to d start to develop an, um, a range of ways that organisations can identify um, those most at risk of loneliness um, some, of the, some of those ways are um, um, utilising, working with local authorities, utilising risk data which local authorities have, this, and that shouldn't compromise um, um, any uh, personal data, um, and or targeted promotion um, within certain local areas so that they know they're reaching maybe those who are more uh, living in um, areas of most risk, um, coupled with something that's really basic like word of mouth, because actually that, that's one of the best ways of actually bringing people in and make sh making sure they stay and enjoy a service. Um, Jane. Thanks, Convener. Um, I just want to say that I absolutely agree that accessible, appropriate and affordable transport is, is a fundamental thing if we're going to address isolation. But I, I'm aware that in, in urban settings, um, older people can become very isolated and sometimes it's because of the design. Um, sheltered housing is sometimes at the back end of the, of the village or the town where the, the buses never go and you can't walk to the shops. And I wonder if anybody wants to comment on, on whether we design in isolation, things like benches, lighting, signage, paths, um, muggers, alleys, all those things make people reluctant to go out. And is that a common experience? Um, do you think that's a factor for older people? Natalie? Um, yeah, I think that's not what I was going to talk about, but I think that's a really valuable point. Um, I'm just back from an exchange in Japan and I actually asked their, um, if their um, environmental design was changing because they have a super ageing society so if they take into account that older people and how they interact with the environment is going to be more impactful going forward so things like and they sort of said around public toilets and things like that they kind of increased um, and made them more uh, user friendly for older yeah. people but I think things like you know benches and places to sit better lighting um, and from our experience of working with social housing partners, this is where we interact and connect with older people. And it's been an absolute vital link for us because they can go to people who are isolated in their home and then connect them into our service, which is Craft Cafe. And within the sheltered housing and care home um, sort of space, we actually bring the community in. So it's about having a space within the care home where people from outside the care home can access and everyone can come together so it's breaking down the isolation in that way because you can be isolated even within a care home not just yeah. within your own home. Yeah. Now go back to Alice I think you want to come in on John's initial question. <clears throat> yes it was just uh, agreeing with uh, some of the other comments have been said but also just to highlight that it's a kind of twofold um, difficulty in terms of the referral source can sometimes be difficult from changes in council and health and social care settings where staff change so perhaps people are referring into services quite willingly and then those um, changes in personnel and therefore you're not getting that continued referral process and from the the purposes of the service user um, uptake in the service uh, we have found that um, <clears throat> some of the things that we have put in place is a, a bit of a person-centred approach where we send in one of our specially trained volunteers to speak to the older person about what would make their life better what would make it easier what what could we do to make their life better and then working with other organizations in the area to put together a package of support to reduce the loneliness and isolation um, so working together so it's a bit of a twofold and there's difficulties letting the older person know of the services we've got so without people referring into us to let us know that the older person's needing help but also for the older person then being able to access the services round about them. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think Annabelle's coming back in on referrals mm -hmm. actually yeah. later. Well I go on to my other yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean Grace already mentioned like LGBT and ethnic minority communities and that was the other area I was interested in that uh, are, are there uh, people from these backgrounds particularly isolated uh, so that's thinking about the individual but I was also thinking um, you know I mean somebody from a Pakistani community say might have a lot of Pakistani friends or friends from that community but they don't have any friends outside of that 
Is that isolation, is that a problem, or is that something we can be relaxed about? Danny, and then Grace. Thanks very much. Just to, I suppose, cover your previous question and that one in the, in the same answer, one of the most important things when we're working with uh, people from ethnic minority communities who also suffer from social isolation is to take into account that not only will they receive the statutory health services, which, which they will receive, you know, being in the circumstances that they're in, but that not that's not the full picture necessarily. So when we're developing uh, avenues to tackle social isolation, that their cultural characteristics are also taken into account when doing that. And sometimes the best places to uh, deliver that service are from within communities themselves, obviously, because they're best avowed at expressing whichever particular characteristics fits the needs of an individual to tackle social isolation. Um, there's been some good examples. We went down to Leicestershire in the past, to Leicester, which is one of Britain's only um, plural communities, i.e. there's no majority ethnic group. And what we've seen is that areas which had high areas of immigration in, in our city, Leicester, which then followed the patterns of immigration which have happened across Britain, i.e. say the Irish community living in Leicester and areas like Northfields, then the Pakistani and so on and so forth, uh, is that there, there's been a great crossover between local service providers and the voluntary sector in terms of if they are aware of an individual or a pocket of a community which is existing in an area of multiple deprivation because social and economic disadvantage exacerbates the loneliness aspect of it and other health inequalities which go alongside it, that there's been that partnership approach. So to get the health service provisioned by statutory bodies and to get the cultural aspect delivered by um, the community. Um, and that it gives it that holistic approach. And do you think that's not happening so much in Scotland? Well, no, it, do, it does happen in Scotland, yes. it does. Happen. I think it was touched upon at a round table previously. There's some great examples in, in inner city Glasgow where there's a high concentration of ethnic minority communities, where there's a lot of partnership work between mosques and temples and other community groups and organisations and others. However, touching upon your point, is, uh, I think what, what you're alluding to is, is there an element of isolation within isolation <laughs> of ethnic minority communities uh, polarising themselves in some aspects. Um, not from that previous example, which I've just given, also uh, you know, broadening going forward from that, actually following on from our previous discussions uh, in January, I think it was, uh, BEMIS, in conjunction with the Scottish Older People's Assembly, will be looking to address the gaps which they've identified within their membership and body and the, and the, and the service which, services which they provide where they've, they've acknowledged, you know, there's not, we're looking at the demographics of the areas that we're servicing and people from ethnic minority communities aren't using this as, as much as good. So there's a great opportunity there, I think, for, you know, a, a cultural crossover within this uh, environment to, to progress that element of it. Yes. Thank you. Um, LGBT older adults are, are much more likely to live alone and um, be estranged from their families of origin, not to have t had children, um, not to necessarily uh, even have a, a relationship or a, a partner, or if they do have a relationship or a partner, um, for that partnership to be very isolated um, from um, family and communities. Um, we have to remember that homosexuality wasn't uh, decriminalised in Scotland until 1980. Um, it was still considered a mental disorder until 1992. And we are working regularly with older adults who their, their reality was imprisonment and institutionalisation with electroconvulsive therapy and uh, hormone treatment. Um, and so what that does is that, that makes LGBT older people much more resistant to trust services because they've been brutalised by services in the past. It also makes older people much less likely to be tolerant of, of homosexuality because they also grew up in an era where homosexuality was, was uh, criminalised. Um, so that, that makes LGBT older adults significantly isolated. Now add the rurality of Dumfries and Galway, for example, on the top of all of that, and it, and it becomes even even worse. Um, now, what you know, your, your your kind of question about you know, are we isolating communities even further by pigeonholing them into LGBT or, or Pakistani, etc. And and yeah, in some ways we probably are. And our our best case scenario is where an LGBT or a Pakistani older adult can go into any lunch club, any daycare centre, any uh, opportunity for an older person and feel integrated and happy and welcomed and supported. 
the fact is we're not there yet, and it's going to be several uh, you know, decades probably until we are there. We're making huge legislative changes and cultural changes in Scotland with the Equal Marriage uh, you know, Bill, etc. Um, however, we've still got a hearts and minds shift, not least for the older generation. So specialist services like LGBT services for older adults or, or other LGBT members of the community, um, I see them very much as a stepping stone which should be in tandem with mainstreaming work to make um, the rest of communities in the sector as inclusive as they possibly can be. What we are now um, finding is that the older adults that we are investing time and support in bringing them together with a social group and making friends are now feeling as a group more confident to access the social, culture and leisure opportunities of Dumfries and Galloway. But without the LGBT hand-holding bit first, um, they wouldn't necessarily have, have done that. Uh, Jenny? I just wanted to pick up on the point about being isolated in a care home and I think again uh, agreeing with you there Grace we in our Moose in the Hoos project where we um, help residents um, use the internet but we had uh, an awareness training um, which was run by LGBT for our volunteers and we found that very interesting in as much that the some of the uh, residents in care are gay and they might have had a partner who has died um, and they might have to hide their photographs because they're embarrassed and it was a very um, it was a great learning curve for our volunteers to to understand you know that, that there's other people in in care who are isolated um, and I think the more we have training and awareness from LGBT uh, folks like yourselves the better it is and I'd just like to quickly comment on also, what Liz and Sheila said, um, going back to John's original question, if um, about attracting more people, um, um, I think if we, ACIT, had more funding, because it's a funding issue, we could do more. But as you say, it's the funding which is the restriction for us, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, John. We're finished, yep. Um, we'll now move on to Annabelle. Thank you, convener. One issue the committee is very interested in is where referrals come from, because you're all doing a power of work in your own um, spheres of activity. So the question is relatively simple. The answer may be a little less straightforward, but we've heard that the majority of referrals um, are probably self-referrals, and I just want to know very briefly, where do most of your referrals come from. Now, I realise Khan is a signposting organisation. This is maybe less relevant to you. And until I listened to you a moment ago, Natalie, I thought maybe it was less relevant to you. But I realise, actually, you are getting referrals from maybe social housing landlords or something like that. So we just want to know, are they, where do the people come from? Are they self-referrals? Do they come from social work? Do they come from GPs? Do they come from housing professionals? Or do they come from somewhere else? Natalie? Um... The, because we partner with social housing um, to deliver Craft Cafe, the majority will come through that. But what we ask um, from all partners is that they commit to being open to the whole community and not just their tenants. Um, so there's a focus around uh, doctor referrals. In, in Govan, we were part of the Alice um, pilot around the therapeutic um, prescription which we've not really had time to analyse yet, but it'll be interesting to sort of see if that has had increased our referrals from um, the NHS. Um, also, organisations like Cargom um, as well refer through a kind of mental health approach um, and other kind of localised services within each specific area. But the main one, the majority is through the social housing, and then that generates word of mouth, which I think is the biggest key to success. I think befriending services across Scotland find that they get a really mixed bag of referrals. We um, at befriending networks don't we don't run befriending services ourselves, but um, because our phone number's up there when somebody Googles befriending, we do get um, a lot of inquiries from people who are lonely, who just want a befriender for themselves. So that would lead us to <clears throat> believe that you know, people are aware that befriending is out there. Um, they can't necessarily get the services they want. Um, there, there are a lot, a lot of self-referrals then. There are lots of referrals from, from family members, actually, who maybe have to move away from their elderly relative for work or for other reasons, who are, you know, feel deeply guilty about leaving that person isolated. And quite often, again, we get anguished phone calls saying, please, is there something out there you know, for my mum or my dad who's 90-something and living on their own? Um, 
befriending services also get referrals from health and social care, from social work, and our evidence recently has been um, taking soundings from such services, not, not exclusively for older people, but for, for mental health services, for example, as well, learning disability, um, that referrals are becoming increasingly more complex, that a social worker will lift the phone and ask for a befriender for somebody who you know, really has very, very complex needs, maybe quite complicated mental health issues or is a sex offender or, you know, really something that is... is is probably beyond the scope of the average befriending service because, after all, befriendi befriendees are supported by befrienders who are volunteers. I mean, they're well-trained volunteers, <clears throat> but the, you know these services are not set up to really cope with, with such complex cases necessarily. Alan? Uh, can I just um, clarify that actually the minority of referrals that we get are from self-referrals? <laughs> The, the majority of referrals that we get are from um, primary care, health staff, GPs, practice nurses, community nurses. We also get a lot of referrals from local area coordinators and care managers, um, community hospital staff um, referring patients who are about to be discharged so that we can put things in place before they get home, um, other council services like visual impairment teams, community psychiatric nurses, mental health social work teams, social workers, and other voluntary organisations as well. Um, we have been steadily growing our referral base over the last few years, and, and we get a, a vast range of referrals in now, but the definite minority is through self-referral. Alison? That's uh, very similar with Royal Voluntary Service, but in addition, we also receive uh, referrals from housing officers, housing associations, occupational therapists as well, um, discharge teams within hospitals. Um, so, just to add on to that as well. Finally, Laura. Um, convener, I might be throwing a spanner in here, and I'm so, I apologise. Um, I just want to be clear about the definition of. Um, isolation and loneliness and it's been coming to me through some other questions but I think when we're talking about referrals it's really useful to keep in mind especially maybe when people are referring others um, it's useful to keep in mind that someone can be isolated and not lonely and someone can be lonely and not physically isolated um, and talking about loneliness is a really stigmatizing thing still for a lot of people and uh, so I apologize for kind of pulling us back to something that I probably should have said right at the beginning. It's just that when we're thinking about all these wonderful avenues for referrals, um, some of the investigation we've done into whether first contact schemes, um, which is a name for a scheme for people like GPs and fire services as well, who I don't think have been mentioned yet, who could have uh, um, direct contact with people who are isolated and could very easily see the isolation. But um, we've found that those first contact schemes are very... Um, thorough in identifying some practical needs of older people but not necessarily they're not geared up they don't have the depth of questioning to find out whether someone's lonely and that's whether they feel um, unhappy with the quality of the relationships that they have and both isolation and loneliness are problematic they can overlap but they don't necessarily lead to each other um, and some of our analysis in two reports one that's been published pub called promising approaches identifies the need for um, referrals and identification. Another that's about to be published called Hidden, Hidden Citizens does talk about first contact schemes and, and that gap of, of helping, say, GPs or occupational therapists to talk about loneliness in a way that will help them overcome the stigma. So hopefully we'll be moving along um, that path and up offering some tools in that space quite soon. Thank you. Annabelle. Thank you. Yeah, we have heard as a committee some evidence that um, older people may be slightly apprehensive about seeking support from either social work services or their GPs because they fear they might lose their independence or they may be um, potentially ending up in a residential home. And all I wanted to know was, have any of you any evidence to support that view? Sheila. Yes, we. I also work as a trustee for a, a community centre, where, which has, is a wellbeing centre. And there is a great fear amongst the people there. They have to prove that they're independent. Going back to the referral thing, one of the referrals actually is for falls prevention. And there's a big move towards training people preventing falls, which is really important if you're living independently. 
The other thing that has come out in some of the work I've been doing recently is that it's the language you use when you like ask about isolation. Um, you have to sort of go round it carefully and maybe just say, are you fed up? And the outcome of some of that work has been that it's better to offer than expect the people to actually ask for help. So um, I think that, yes, they are very frightened of being put into a box and um, expected to do something or go down the road of being referred to things that they don't really want to do. And they do value their, their independence very, very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? No. Annabelle, are you finished now? No, I think, okay? I think I mean I think that's quite interesting. So really with the exception of um, Sheila, no one else has any evidence of that scenario. We don't have specific evidence on that, but what we have found is when we do our evaluation work with our members, they are very they're unwilling at first to talk about their medical conditions, their um, money, their, you know, any, if they smoke or if they drink or, you know, it takes a long time to build up a, a trust. And quite often it's when we go back and, and kind of redo the paperwork sort of six months on, people feel more relaxed and they feel more able to talk about what's troubling them and what issues they do have. And at that point, then you're able to sort of um, support them and what they need. Um, but it takes time. And I think that's, and it, and it is about trusting. It's about the trust that you have with that person. And it's about that person-centred approach because it's it's not just a, a doctor in an office or, you know, it's someone that you can talk to and trust. Maybe more personal pride than fear, but it's yeah. still inhibiting. Exactly. And I think it's interesting, you know, that when we did our SROI, the topics that most often people didn't want to talk to about were money and alcohol. Everything else, pretty much at that stage, they were like, yeah, yeah, I've got this wrong with me. Blah, blah, blah. But... They were the two ones where people are like, no. And you have to respect that and understand it. Grace, did you want to come in? And then Danny. Uh, yeah, just, just briefly, um, I mean, our, our service users haven't specifically um, said that they are frightened about speaking to their GP for, for fear that they would be, be put in a care home. But we do know our service users are frightened of, of what might happen if they were in a care home um, because they don't feel comfortable that, um, that care home staff would be able to deal appropriately with their, um, with their issues, not least for transgender individuals where uh, intimate care um, might be a particular issue um, if their gender presentation doesn't match the, the genitals that they, that they still have. Um, in terms of the referral thing, just briefly as well, um, the vast majority of ours are self-referral, and part, part of that is because 99% of services will never ask an older person about their sexual orientation or gender identity, so that will never be um, picked up. And interestingly, we have self-referrals and people accessing our services from uh, Ayrshire, Scottish Borders, Kendall, someone comes up from regularly, from, uh, and others from Cumbria. Um, and that's partly because there are... Um, in Scotland, four very underfunded um, groups for LGBT older people, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Inverness and Dumfries and Galloway, and that's, that's all. So we're, we're, you know, it's a wide net that we're, we're having to catch in terms of the people that are, are trying to access our services. Danny. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we are regularly contacted by different departments at the NHS who are concerned about the lack of engagement with minority ethnic communities across a whole range of policy areas. It may well be the case that this is reflected um, within the area or the question which you've just asked, and that may would be most likely due to cultural reasons or the prevalence to place the emphasis on family and local community. Um, in terms of that, I think it's. I'm glad you've brought it to the to, to the committee, and it's certainly something we'll give more consideration to as we progress our own work in this area. Thanks, okay, Thank Annabelle. You. Yep. Um, thanks very much for those replies, and we'll move on to Sandra now. Thank you very much, Eugenia. <clears throat> I wanted to look at the, the kind of bigger picture, uh, following on from what Annabelle has said about you know health and social care and the integration that we're looking at. I passed uh, yesterday, first of April, uh, coming into law. I was really quite surprised when you mentioned the fact that most of your referrals, not just word of mouth, but do come from the health service, because previous witnesses basically were saying that GPs didn't have enough time to spend with people who come to see them and didn't recognise the loneliness. So I just wondered if uh, there is a bigger role uh, for, for GPs, health service, social work services, uh, to prescribe not necessarily, obviously, medicine, but going along to some of your clubs or that. Should that be part of the integration model that we're looking at under social work and health and care? That they can actually send them there because the evidence you've given, it seems to be we're touching on people who already are in the system, whereas... 
the people who are not in the system, who really are isolated and lonely, are not able to access the services. I just wondered your thoughts on that particular one. Natalie and then Alison. Um, yeah, so as I briefly mentioned, we are part of that pilot scheme and govern around therapeutic prescriptions, and I think that is really, really valuable. GPs are rightly quite locked doors um, from us coming in as a, a third sector community programme. We aren't really able to get access to the GP and sort of say, you know, this is what we want to do, which, you know, that's absolutely right in terms of... Um, patient confidentiality but for the GP then to have that ability to kind of go actually there's this service it's around the corner from you it's perfect you should go to it I think it would be greatly empowering to both the patient and to, to the doctor. Thank you Alice and then Liz. Yeah um, I would agree um, it was uh, we've been trying very hard to work with GPs across um, Scotland in terms of trying to get GPs to work much more closely with the voluntary sector and to refer into the services a number of people that present to GPs on a Monday present to GP on a Monday because they don't have anything else they just it's for, for um, company if uh, we have interjection in there those referrals could come to us to provide those services and that would reduce the the, the times for GPs and the, the stresses that GPs go through with having so many to deal with. Thank you, Liz. Um, we had uh, a, a, our conference last November, a presentation from somebody in the deep end group of GPs, the most, the most deprived um, communities in the country. Um, the GP was from Drum, Tap, Drum Chapel, and he was talking about social prescribing. But, you know, as you've said, GPs, you know, I think are extremely busy, obviously, and there is such a turnover sometimes of third sector organisations. It's very, very hard for them to keep up with exactly what is available in their community. The, um, the GP from Drum Chapel that we heard from was talking about a link worker that was located within their surgery that whose job it was actually to go and connect with community groups um, and refer patients to them and inform patients to them. And I think that's possibly a bit more of a realistic um, model than, than GPs themselves keeping up with absolutely everything that's going on in their community. Grace. Um, I absolutely agree that social prescribing is really important and we've had a, a quite successful pilot in Dumfries and Galloway around that as well. Um, another interesting initiative that I heard about, because one of my other roles is a, as a non-exec director on the NHS board in Dumfries and Galloway, is the new chaplain listening service. Um, and the new um, scheme, as far as I understand it, is uh, not necessarily about religious figures um, becoming chaplains, but actually um, any skilled person within the community um, becoming a, a, an expert listener to be and could be based in GP practices. So those those individuals might have much more time to spend um, with people um, when they're feeling lonely and isolated, perhaps just after a bereavement and so forth as well, um, and, and then be able to also link into social prescribing. And again, we mustn't forget that you know older people don't ha just have to be passive recipients of these services, but actually they can then volunteer their time in those services, which also reduces isolation. Um, and bringing in schemes like time banking too, where um, you know they can bank voluntary hours and gain things back from people. All of those things, I think, can work really well um, in tandem. But the, the third sector has to have a hugely critical part in uh, integration of health and social care. Um, that's, that's clear, um, I think, and, and we need to make sure that, that all of the, the joint delivery plans and, uh, and so forth have got a really big focus on, on third sector organisations supporting all of that. Sheila, Laura and then Karen. Yes, um, I would agree with what Grace has just said about the, the importance of... Uh, recognising what's out there. It works very well in small communities where the doctor's surgery is close to the community centre where the activities take place. And again, it's a big a big thing about actually making known what's out there. And the point that Karen made about sometimes things are on a website or thought about and not know, you know, until you actually go and try and access the service, you find out that it's long gone and it's no longer there. I was thinking, as you were talking about, is maybe... There is a place for advertising and doctor surgeries of activities that are available in the community. Um, I know there's a little bit of reluctance in some doctor surgeries for this to happen, but it might be the way of helping to raise awareness of what's out there. Okay, thank you. Um, Laura? Thank you, convener. I would definitely um, 
uh, recommend a more strategic approach and um, across health and social care. So um, looking at um, not just raising awareness, but commitments to action from the NHS regional boards. Um, and that should flow through down to GPs and other um, frontline um, health and social care workers. Um, but I would also recommend, as well as GP social prescribing, other navigator schemes within communities. I think someone mentioned one um, earlier. Um, so Health in Mind is an organisation. The Campaign to End Loneliness has about a 1,000 organisations who are our supporters, and you know we welcome everyone here to join us if you haven't already, um, even MSPs. Um, Health in Mind, one such organisation, offering a range of um, services. They're also offering a navigator role, which is basically a volunteer who knows about activities in a local area and is able to point not just within their own organisation but to others. So it's that type of partnership, I think, between statutory and voluntary organisations which really starts to open up and overcome some of the kind of knowing about what's actually current and, and the 15-year-old camera clubs um, that, that might still be um, preventing people from really getting into activities that they could enjoy. Thank you. Karen. Um, when our project started, we solely took referrals from primary care and the project limped along very small. One or two GPs in Aberdeenshire, there are, I think, 63 GP practices in Aberdeenshire. One or two GPs referred in and the rest didn't. Trying to get GPs to engage is, is very, very difficult, and I think anyone who has tried around this table will say it's, it is very, very difficult to get GPs to buy in, but if you're lucky enough to get one GP within a practice who gets it and uses it, they will tell their colleagues and they will buy in. We're now at the stage, after opening the project up to um, other services um, within the NHS, within the local councils, voluntary sector, the GP started to take notice, and um, I actually had one GP who the service had been available to his practice for about four years at a meeting where someone mentioned our project, ask why the project wasn't available in her sur his surgery, and we had been for four years, but he had never used us and he didn't know, even although I had spoken to him in person four years before. But once they get it, they really get it, and they realise that the amount of time that it can save. Um, and, I, and I understand what you're saying about people who are hard to reach. And one of the things that we have found is that the self-referrals that we get tend to be the hard to reach people who aren't really engaged with any services, but they find out about us from other places, like libraries keep stocks of our leaflets and things like that, and other community groups do. And they'll hear about it maybe through word of mouth, and they'll contact us then. And, and that's the ones that we find who really need the help with the isolation and social contact. But the GPs in the Shire and the other statutory services workers seem to be really good at picking up on it. And we have a really good, close working relationship. And I, I think I can honestly say, in working with the NHS and Aberdeenshire Council, we have at no time felt like the junior partner when working with them. We're very much treated on a par with their colleagues and the same level of respect and the same level of regard. And it makes for a very successful working relationship, which is why our, re our referral base doubles year on year. Thank you very much, Sandra. You OK? I didn't know if Danny wanted to come in. Is that all right, Jim? Yeah. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. yeah, sure uh, yeah, just to reiterate, I think I made the point earlier about the experience and of what's happening in Leicestershire, so I'd agree completely with what's been said here. For diverse communities, diverse citizens, we need diverse services, and that's the best way done via a partnership approach. There's just one other thing. I think the harder to reach thing is absolutely critical as well, particularly when we consider that the potential for an exacerbation of loneliness and isolation will be more prevalent within areas of social and economic disadvantage. So when we have this place-based approach to tackling any policy issue which looks at it, you know, uh, driving towards uh, areas of multiple deprivation, that's all well and good, but it's, you have to take into consideration also and taking the harder to reach um, line that the Equality and Human Rights Commission released a report, Harder to Reach, which pointed out from our ethnicity and race perspective that Chinese, Indian and Pakistani communities are much more likely to live generally in poverty outside of areas of multiple deprivation. So that, you know, coordinated partnership approach across the country, both in areas of multiple deprivation and outside, is needed to tackle the potential problems in terms of isolation. Thank you very much. Just, just a small and it can probably be a yes or a no answer. Um, do you think that uh, the third sector should be involved much more closely in the new integration boards? Should perhaps have a place on there or be able to directly speak into it? And possibly something more controversial, it can be yes or no as well. Uh, in regards to funding, which we know is, uh, funding is a big issue, 
once integration you know takes takes part and we've got the boards, do you think some funding should come from you know this new integration board and not always just from lottery or whatever it may be? I know that's controversial, but I'll just put it out there. Well, I'll take Jenny because she was trying to come in previously. Thanks, convenient. I just wanted to back uh, Sheila and Laura's point about um, strategic planning for advertising within uh, GP surgeries. I mean, our le most of our learners are come self-referrals, word of mouth and, and that sort of thing, but we also have a few um, referrals from OTs, but we had a targeted marketing campaign um, where we produced leaflets into doctor surgeries you know, that was something that we did off our own back. Um, and I think, it, as Laura clearly pointed out, that that should be part of the strategic planning, that doctor surgeries should, by not right, not by right, but, I mean, have uh, some sort of uh, package whereby they can see that, that ACIT or organisations like us and the services that we are offering are av available as opposed to um, a marketing campaign from... ACIT. Yeah, thank you. Could I have a reply to Sandra's very last question, but very short, because we've got other three members that want to come in, Natalie. Just around that challenge of funding, I think the biggest issue that we have for Delivering Craft Cafe, and I think it's come up in lots and lots of different guises for this discussion, is that how to continue that service. Um, older people's um, services are not short term fixes, they are long term programmes and the need sometimes doesn't go away, it quite it doesn't go away, it grows. So unfortunately three year funding packages don't support us or anything like this to kind of carry on and do the work that it needs to do and there's also a, there's always a fear of that programme falling away like the camera club that disappeared after 15 years. So if anything that can be done to address how older people's programmes are funded I think is a, a, a fantastic leap forward. OK, thank you very much. And moving now smoothly on to Mr Finney. Um, thank you, Kavina. Um, I'd be interested in the, the witnesses' views about the use of IT. There's been a lot of uh, mention made in there. And to understand what the benefits are, I mean, clearly it's been laid out in many of the, the, the statements that we've had, but it'd be good to, to have it on the record. And then if I could maybe extend it with the convener's indulgence a, a bit beyond that, the use of... Um, telecare, telehealth, and whether that compounds feelings of isolation, perhaps, rather than physical contact. So, I mean, we all want to embrace the technology. Are there any... So, clearly there'll be some upsides. It'd be good to hear them, but are there any downsides as well? Sure. I think one of the issues, especially in the, the more rural areas, is access to a signal. Um, but for globally, the, the biggest issue, I think, is the cost of actually having those services in place. Um, and the, the new iPhones, the new smartphones are really very expensive and there are a lot of, especially in the transport field, a lot of um, operators are saying, I've got an app for this or I've, and it is losing, a lot of the, the older people are not understanding and not really able to use that technology, not able to pay for that technology. So I think a lot of work has to got to be done on it. Um, on the telehealth issue, Usually the telehealth is going to be offered in a centre, not directly into their own home. So there's still a transport issue of the person getting from home to wherever the, the telehealth is available. So I think that, you know, it's early days. I don't really know if it will isolate people um, from... Usually travelling on the bus as, as, is as important as actually re reaching the destination, especially if they're doing it on a regular basis, because they build up a, a group of friends that they travel with. So I think, yes, if we do go down the, the road of having everything telehealth, I think it will cause more isolation. Okay. Thank you. I have Laura, and can I ask you to keep your answers quite short, because we're running uh, short of time as well. Um, we recently brought together um, around 30 frontline organisations to talk about how they use technology and how they would want to use technology in the future to help their beneficiaries, the people they work with, come together. And some of the conclusions from that workshop were um, almost common sense in terms of technology. Technology isn't a replacement for real face-to-face -face contact, but it can enhance it, um, particularly for um, keeping contacts with current 
friends and family, but actually also um, the the ability to come together through IT training, for example, can enable you to make new friends. Um, but there is a caution there, of course, about um, about replacing. Um, and we would say there's probably not enough evidence around telecare at the moment to, to know whether that's um, pushing um, loneliness either way. Um, I would also throw in a future, um, uh, if you like, a futurology type question um, about the use of technology by people in their 60s, 70s and 80s now will be very different to those who are in those age groups in 10 or 20 years' time, and the technology itself will, of course, change. So those that cohort coming through are more likely to be technology um, fiends, if you like, and how to, how to encourage them to balance that um, would be another challenge we don't necessarily have now. Thank you. Jenny? I think the... The positive notes that uh, surround older people and um, IT have been pretty well documented. Um, I think I'd just like to pick up what, what uh, Sheila was saying, that um, I can't speak for uh, all the people that we haven't taught, as opposed to all the thousands of people that we have taught, but there's definitely barriers, and one, one of which is cost for uh, an older person. And the other thing is about uh, for an older person to see the benefit of using technology. Um, I've got a little quote here from one of our learners who says, um, I think I've bored too many friends going on about the advantages of uh, having a computer. I love Skyping my family members, which picks up, up on Laura's point again, um, that things like Skype and email are so important, but it's getting that message across to the heart-to-reach groups, like we've mentioned before. Um, but I agree with Laura that technology doesn't replace a face as such. Thank you. Christian? I was just asking you a, a little point on this. Technology uh, did replace face-to-face -face when you had the introduction, the introduction of the telephone, and a lot of this uh, uh, generation used the telephone very extensively. Unfortunately, the new generations are not using the phone anymore. As the telephone become obsolete and therefore uh, uh, creating more isolation, is that Les some comment you received? If I could just um, come back to befriending services, there are a, a large number, I would say a growing number of telephone befriending services in the country. Um, that's partly driven, I think, by resources, but it's also <clears throat> found to meet a need among people who can't leave the house, won't leave the house, or in some um, circumstances, people who are a bit nervous about face-to-face -face, face -face befriending and actually you know, satisfies a need in them. So I think certainly among older people, um, you know, the, the telephone is still is, as long as you can hear. You know, as long as if people haven't got a hearing problem, then anybody can benefit from a telephone befriending service. But unfortunately, the only people who telephone nowadays are people who try to sell you something. <laughs> families, <laughs> families don't phone anymore. It's what you hear all the time. Yes, yeah, that's very true. Um, uh, you know, but but again, as I said, telephone befriending services are they are expanding. Um, so that you know, the telephone's perhaps not quite dead yet. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Are you finished yet? Um, Jane Baxter. I want to talk a little bit about how services anticipate and identify where loneliness or isolation might be an issue and um, how they work out how to intervene or when to intervene and how we can intervene earlier and more appropriately. And um, we've heard that health and, and social work um, agencies are, are very important. Are there any other agencies that are on the front line when it comes to identifying where individuals might be lonely or feeling isolated? Bus drivers, for example, people on okay. the bus, you know, they might, the bus driver might be aware of that. Sheila? I was, I was thinking when Jane was speaking about churches because sometimes just going to church um, makes people aware that there is an issue. Uh, and sometimes within the church that is solved, but they do refer on to other um, activities where they can. And I would also say that the other side of it is that where churches are creating services, there is sometimes a problem because people are still very... There's sectarianism going on, that they will not go if it's in the wrong church. And I think that's very... I've come across, across this very recently in my local area, that it's very, very difficult then to persuade people to go to an activity that's been put on by the community because of where it's actually situated. I'm um, sorry that's not really answered your question, Jean, but it's, a, it's, an it's given food for thought. Anybody else? Um, I would say uh, local shops 
quite often um, before coming to Craft Cafe, our, a lot of our members would just go to the shop once a day just to have a chat, really, just to, they didn't really need anything. Um, it was just they were buying their pint of milk just to really have contact. And I think around the, the bus scenario, we used to, we had a, a member who, prior to coming on, would just sit on the bus all day and just travel around the city um, because that's all he had to do if he's day and it was free because he had his bus pass. So, yeah. In the third sector, tap into all that knowledge and awareness. Is there scope for local partnerships? What can councils and, and integration partnerships do about that? How do, how do you make those connections? To partly answer your past question as well, mm -hmm. um, there's been an interesting trial run between local chemists and the third sector um, in a number of places. Um, then they integrated quite basic questions and, and a questionnaire into... Um, prescriptions um, and um, it generated some interesting results but the thing that I'd flag with most of the services we've already identified is that they might not um, a separate point is that they might not reach men um, men are less likely to go to GPs um, for example and so um, different tax might be needed I'm not trying to cast aspersions mm -hmm. but pubs um, bookies other places where um, men are, are more likely to gather and then of course it's back to the how do you bring this up in that type of situation and setting especially it's a very delicate thing to be to be talking about uh, can I just sort of come in as well on Maybe that I'm kind of thinking as well with my hat on for towns and town centres. We've also got the post offices as well. Um, when I went to speak to post office, they actually develop a relationship with the the people coming in and out. And they were actually saying if somebody didn't turn up one day, they would worry about what happened to them. And that's possibly a place. And also your local um, supermarket, your small local independent supermarkets as well, that tends to get to know people as well and I'm wondering if that is a possible source as well for contacts and referrals as well the heads are nodding so it seems to be yes yep. Grace in some of the weird places as well community mm -hmm. councils are um, could play a potentially important role um, and it, it would sure be more important than just talking about potholes all the time so um, <laughs> that could help yeah that's an excellent idea yeah. anybody else no back to you Jane I think there is a, a role for people like local councillors and community councillors to take on board a responsibility to develop that knowledge and feed it in when they get the chance to. They're, they're well placed to do that, but they don't often remember to do that. And I'm also interested in the point about services for men and women, because I was going to ask about that. And uh, the men's shed was spoken about before in this committee, and we're getting a new men's shed in Fife, so I'm quite excited about that. Um, although I'm not a man. <laughs> But, uh, well, that's a different meeting. Um, I was going to ask about how, how you tailor services for men and women. Is that something that, that, that you take on board actively, or does it, is it um, more, yeah, okay, help? <laughs> um, for some reason, and, I, and we're still trying to figure this one out, Craft Cafe is equally popular with men as it is with women, which, from my time in this kind of field, is quite unusual and as I need to research this more but I think it's because it's around people do what they want to do and there's no one telling people what to do it's like what do you want to do today and if that's build something or listen to music or have a cup of tea then that's your choice and I think that's quite an important factor in why it, it's quite equal across the genders for us in our experience. And Karen? In terms of or, uh, services being tailored differently for men and women. Speaking for befriending services, um, it's not necessarily the service that's delivered differently, but it has to be advertised differently. Um, you know, we have to coax men in sometimes. Um, mm. I did an evaluation in um, a sheltered housing scheme last year where there was a group befriending service, really, really successful, but it didn't touch any of the men in the sheltered housing. I spoke to the ladies who were in that group, and they all said oh, the men just wouldn't join because they think it's just women knitting and gossiping. It was a little bit more than that. But so, the, the, you know, there's a bit of an image yeah. problem. Um, we also find with, um, in terms of volunteer befrienders, if there is a good um, cohort of male volunteer befrienders, then it's, you know, easier to get more men because volunteering um, for befriending develops by word of mouth. So once there's a kind of hardcore, if you like, of men, it's it's a bit more easy to get to get additional men in. Karen, 
Uh, a few years ago, we had a cluster of clients in an urban setting in a local town who were all in almost identical circumstances. They were bereaved in the last 12 months. They had no friends, no social contacts out with the relationship that they had. And they were all desperately lonely and very, very isolated and needed some form of social contact and wanted to build friendships. They had tried pretty much between them everything that was available to them in their local area and none of it suited. And we looked about for something different and couldn't find anything. So we approached our local change fund for older people and asked for funding to set up a project which offered them the ability to contact with people who had experienced the same sort of things that they had experienced, who had similar life experiences, that some similar likes and dislikes, but would offer them a chance to make friends, not just um, someone that they met at a club, but actual friendships. Um, that started in January 2012. Um, the initial group has grown to six established groups and three fledgling groups throughout Aberdeenshire. Um, the original group in Inverurie now has 18 members who regularly come along and is starting to take over the venue that they meet in. The majority of them are men, which surprised us, and men who didn't go to their GP very often, didn't really have much contact with statutory services, didn't really have very much contact with everyone, with anyone at all, but by various means had ended up coming to the project to be seen, and, and we were ecstatic that these were you know, what we would class as hard-to-reach men, and we managed to get them together, and genuine friendships have formed within that group. And they meet as a group once a week, but they also go off and do things together by themselves, as they feel like. Um, some of them have introduced the other ones to casinos, they've gone to restaurants, they've done all sorts of things. Two of them went on holiday to Australia. Um, it, it's been a, a hugely successful venture. But what it does is it offers them friendship it doesn't offer them something prescriptive they can dip in and out as they want they can do what they want we don't tell them what to do we don't tell them where to go it's very much about forming friendships in a natural way and not a forced way um and it's been a real learning curve for us because this is people that is, it's extremely hard to connect with and we are seeing them connecting with each other which is the ideal the less input we have to have to that the better it's it's an organic thing with it, and it really, really works. And it's something that we are incredibly proud of and trying to grow throughout Aberdeenshire um, and are having you know, quite a bit of success with. Thanks. Come in and then, John. I just wanted to come in and say, in regarding you know, hard to reach and uh, out into communities, uh, we found that in my area in Glasgow, in Partick, for instance, when it was hard to reach men, rather than uh, anything that was health-related, we brought that into the local community, uh, whether it be the local cafes who had an open day with the men and others used it. So therefore, that was the easiest way to reach them. But on another point, I was just thinking, when you're talking about leaflets or, or you know, a directory where you can go, the amount of uh, local shops and charity shops where people, and you know, there's lots in, in my area as well as other areas, where people go and spend hours because they're lonely. And they wonder about, I wonder if that would be an area where you could put, you know, the leaflets, etc., into the charity shops, just reaching out to, to people that's able to pick them up as they're wandering about there, you know? John, sorry, it wasn't a question, it was just no, an observation. Karen, some of the things Karen said there I found quite interesting, and, and maybe, I don't know if you could give us a one-page summary of that particular project and how it worked, because I'm interested, you went to the Change Fund... Um, was that uh, I'd be interested in that process was that easy and, and I mean therefore have you got a worker or something is that who's enabling all this to happen and is that sustainable and how, how, um, how long is that for we, we couldn't we couldn't find anything um, to suit and we couldn't put the clients in contact with each other because of the data protection act so we decided that because we couldn't find anything we had to create something ourselves so we were already funded by the Aberdeenshire Change Fund for Older People for signposting for older people so we went to them with a funding proposal, with the evidence to back up why it was necessary, and they accepted that and they funded that. It was incredibly easy. The Aberdeenshire Council have been very, very supportive of us. We've been really lucky. And we're actually now being funded through the Integrated Care Fund for the next 12 months. Um, so we have a really, really good, strong relationship with, with Aberdeenshire Council because we've always been able to demonstrate that we're working, we're value for money, and that we're, that we're, doing, we're doing good work. Um, the project didn't at all grow as we thought it would because our initial idea was that we would match people with other similar-minded people um, and they would go off in pairs. But because we had such a large group to begin with, we decided to get them all together 
to see what kind of pairs naturally formed. But the group formed and has stayed formed and has just kind of taken everyone in as time has went along. And it wasn't what we thought was going to happen at all. Um, but we're, we're really pleased with it because all of them have at some point in the past, um, after they were bereaved, tried to join something and were put off because they felt that they were excluded or the group was cliquey or no one was there to greet them or they weren't, you know, things weren't explained to them. Every one of them had a reason why they had tried to do something and were put off and just retreated that little bit further. So every single person in that group knows what it's like to come along to a group where you don't know anyone else and you're the stranger. So they're very, very conscious of that and they will always, all of them, take the responsibility for welcoming new people in. So it's an extremely strong group um, and we're very, very proud of it. And, and through that we've generated other spin-off groups throughout Aberdeenshire. We still have people who come to the group, because we only had the one group to start with when it was piloted, <coughs> we have people who come to the group from 20, 30 miles away. And because they like the group that they joined, they stay in that group. But a couple of them have also spun off to the group that's more local to them as well. Um, and, and some of them are actually good recruiters for their groups because they go and tell people about it as well. Um, and it, it's been a very organic process because we've tried to have as little intervention as possible, with the exception of having someone there to make sure that everything goes OK and that people are welcomed in and things like that. It's been allowed to develop or naturally, um, and we don't interfere. It's the Out and About project. That, that's what it is, right? Sorry. sorry. I should have said no, that's that. Right. I think no, it was thanks. mentioned earlier. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Jane, are you just okay? Just quickly, just a, just a, um, I think this has been covered, but I'm wondering, um, we've heard about the voluntary sector facing barriers around funding, um, knowledge, um, awareness. Are there any other things that, that prevent the third sector from doing more or working more together? to address social isolation? I think I think it might have been covered. It was just to give people the chance to, to say... Laura, yeah. I think it's coming back to that strategic view and there being a leadership role. I know we've touched on that, but I wanted to answer in relation to your yep. question and that this whole range of amazing services we're hearing about needs, I think, <laughs> a, a view of um, what, that, what those pieces look like when they fit together. And so it, it will help with things like referrals. And it will help um, with things like um, word of mouth, where people within a service know that there's somewhere else if someone has come in, doesn't necessarily want that particular service. So um, we definitely say there's a kind of four levels, if you like, enablers that wrap around the whole community. So things like age friendly views um, and, the, and touched on the stigma. Um, there's the direct services we've, we've talked a lot about, but that can also include things about changing people's mindsets, and we haven't really touched on that. Things like mindfulness, which is a way of enabling people to be more present with their, with their current experience. And so basically loneliness could be seen as um, a difference between the level and quality of relationships you have you have, sorry, down here, and the level that you want. And often services are trying to increase the level you have to the level you want. But actually there might be an element of um, helping people to become more accept, um, accepting of their current reality. So it's trying to be diplomatic as possible about it. But basically helping people be at peace with what, what they've currently got. So there are a number of levels, and we would say there's a leadership role that's needed. And that's out with any one third sector organisation's role, we'd say that's with, I think, um, health and social care. Very, very briefly, Grace, and then I need yeah. to move on to the next person. Okay. Okay. It was just a brief thing about, about funding. Um, the change yeah, fund yeah. was great, but it was all about innovation, and I think sometimes that can be the death of the third sector. Um, you know, we, we know what we do, we do it well, but we kind of get money to continue to do it because we've got to do it differently somehow. So I think, I think you know, innovation is really important, and we need to stay ahead of the game, but we can't forget that actually, you know, third sector, really good workers will leave because they know their contract comes to an end in three months and they've got to find another job, and, and we have to start all over again. So um, just a wee kind of word of warning with that, I think. Thank you. And um, we'll move on now to Christian. Yes, uh, my question will be about what's the possible action. You know, you, Laura talked about the strategic uh, need to, uh, to plan, uh, for, for example, uh, for advertising. Uh, we talked about in the previous evidence about a national campaign. 
Uh, we heard a lot about this morning about community boards being in GPs, maybe in bookies for men, because of course men is quite important uh, to reach, difficult to reach uh, very often men. Uh, I want to hear of what we could do in the future. And then uh, what I want to take the example of Karen, because I know that in Aberdeenshire is maybe one of the reasons we are so well placed with the man shed with your services is because you've got that kind of priority. We've got people coming from everywhere because there's a high level of, uh, of employment and we've got a great mix of people already. We've got people who live a lot longer and people who've been very active during their life. So those people wants to be empowered to make sure that they are not lonely and they, they maybe they maybe understand uh, they are a lot more aware of a situation than other places maybe won't be because they know they are separated from their own families, they are separated from, from uh, they, they are a lot more isolated automatically than other people will be. So that would maybe be what Scotland would look like in the future in every community. So how can we do to address this? What's a possible action and do we need a national campaign? Okay, who would like to go first? Nobody? Okay, Natalie, and then will I pick lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if this answers the question or not, but I, I think something that's working really well in other countries um, is around people who have just retired, because people who have just retired are not old, they are, you know, they are healthy, they have a lot to give, um, and there's a lot of schemes running around those people who have just retired who are not ready to sort of just sit back, they still want to be really active, and for them to take on quite an active role within the community to support people who are older than them. Um, and if that's through volunteering, if it's through being just a friend, if it's taking them out, if it's doing their washing, if it's doing, you know, and kind of those localised communities. And I think that's the absolute key is it's not removing people from where they're familiar, it's keep, keeping people where they are, feel comfortable and where, they, where is their home, where they have existing networks of friends and even familiarity with space. Um, so that's happening really well. And I kind of want to explore that through our project in terms of how we do that through voluntary um, workers um, who are just retired and is that then a way of sustainability for these kind of projects? I don't know. Thank you. Les, Laura. Sorry, Laura. Thanks, Convener. Um, we think what needs to happen next is, is that bigger picture stuff. Um, it's about creating a positive image. Um, despite our name, a positive image of keeping connected in older age. Um, so it's uh, changing attitudes within wider society. But we also need that leadership role within health and social care and also local authorities who have responsibility for things like transport. Um, I've touched on what people who are themselves currently lonely could be helped with more, something around changing their thinking, as well as supporting them practically and personally, one-to-one. -one. And then finally, we'd definitely say, and we're helping frontline organisations to better reach out. So there are kind of four levels within our Promising Approaches Framework, which we published um, in January, where we will be working. National campaign, yes, there absolutely should be a national campaign, um, particularly on those areas we would recommend. And um, to be very cheeky, um, we would love to work with as many Scottish um, organisations as possible, and Welsh and English and Northern Irish, to um, develop um, that cam campaign over the coming years. Thank you. Um, Sheila and then Danny. I want to say really just about the transport issue, it's not a statutory requirement to provide public transport or any other form of transport apart from school transport. So on the transport issue, when local authorities' budgets are being cut, they're not really, the, the first thing they draw back from is the provision of transport for social activities. Um, I was also going to say something else, but I've actually forgotten what it was now. So um, when I get started in transport, I usually spend a lot of time speaking about it. Um, we do have a problem. The change fund has been very, very good, but uh, what was said earlier, we need to find ways of continuing that funding. Uh, do you want me to go to Danny and then get yes. back to Danny? Just two points. Yeah, I think we're, we've taken into consideration the fact that we need a much broader holistic approach in terms of organising and making a coherent drive with all of these services which exist. But I'd also agree and, and chime with Laura here about the need for a a national campaign, but like any campaign, just to caution that it's not to reinforce stereotypes, but to completely uh, change the image and the discourse and the rhetoric and the culture in which we're interpreting and engaging with diverse citizens 
in which we include uh, people who, who who are elderly. You know, they're still citizens. They still have potential. They still have a lot to give to their local communities. They're not a burden. Um, and to change that, you know, that image and, and the way we talk about them. And if that national campaign was able to achieve that and have that trickle down effect and 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 start to create that cultural shift uh, alongside the more holistic approach across voluntary and statutory services, then that would be. Um, at least to some measure, the next stage, we believe, in, in progressing this agenda. Thank you. Sheila? The other point I was going to make was about Natalie saying that the, the younger, older people <laughs> are able to help. But the problem is that we're now having a pension age increase. So we're not seeing as many younger, older people coming along to volunteer. And I think there's actually beginning to be a crisis in this because the, we are seeing an awful lot of older people um, presenting for help, but we're not really seeing so many volunteers coming along who are able to help. And I'd, I'd really like round the room to try and find out how we are going to address this because it could be having time off work, to, more time off work to volunteer. But at the moment, we're about to hit a crisis, I think. Um, just as well, building on what uh, Sheila was saying before about the churches, the churches play a massive role at the moment in terms of supporting isolated older people, but for how much longer is, is my question. I think, you know, we don't quite know what um, the, the churches will look like in 20 years. They're emptying by the droves. Um, so, um, and, and who will take responsibility for our older uh, adults within communities um, apart from funded services? Um, and so what I'd like to see as well as, as, well as the kind of younger, older person um, where are young people in this and where is intergenerational work in, in general within this because I think we need to kind of narrow that chasm that now exists between older people and, and younger people um, because that will you know, help both, both groups. Do you, do you think that should be part of the national campaign that not only address the national campaign shouldn't be towards only the older people but all generations mm -hmm. and making sure that we've got a discussion about it and people are aware of what's happening in society today? Absolutely. I mean, you know, how many young people regularly visit their grandparents these days and or phone. Um, you know, or phone, exactly. Things are things are changing and and, um, and it's gonna you know lead lead to real problems. So I think that it needs to be targeted to, to all members of society yet. Okay, Liz and John. Um, and first of all, in terms of national campaign, I would absolutely echo what Laura has to say. And if I may say so, you know, there already is a national campaign in England. It's called the Campaign to End Loneliness. Um, <clears throat> and it's absolutely fantastic. And certainly we have, we at Befriending Networks have taken a lot of tools and tips from the campaign. So if we're looking at a national campaign, please let's not reinvent wheels. Please let's learn from what works elsewhere and, you know, um, what's already established um, good practice and suite of resources and all the rest of it. Um, we at Befriending Networks are doing two tiny things um, on zero budget. <laughs> We've got Befriending Week, which is in November, which is a national you know, campaign for befriending services, trying to get more volunteers on board and trying to support uh, small befriending services in particular to be able to trumpet about what they do. And currently we are also, um, we've embarked on a, what we're calling grandly a roadshow, health and loneliness roadshow, um, which has been in planning for a couple of years now, um, which means that we're basically schlepping around every health service area in Scotland, talking to anybody who'll turn up within a three-hour lunchtime slot about health and loneliness and the connections. Um, and the response has been incredible uh, so far. There's another one, if anybody's not doing anything in Edinburgh next Tuesday, there's another one um, at lunchtime. Um, but, you know, so we're finding... You know, organisation professionals are really, really engaged with this. Once they know about the issue, they're really engaged and, you know, keen to do something and to take action. Um, just very quickly, though, we need to know, in tandem with a, a national campaign, we need to know actually where we want to be. So there's something. I think, to be had in the conversation about assessment tools and measuring tools. Loneliness, I think, needs to be in performance pre performance frameworks, possibly under the well as a well-being indicator. So I think there's some work to be done at looking at that so that we know um, when we get there, you know, so that we know we can describe the picture as it is and also know what we're aiming for. John? Uh, thank you, Convener. Well, Liz actually touched on it there just latterly, and that is words like performance framework, preventative spend, because we heard from Laura earlier, and indeed in your own evidence and from others, we hear about the significant uh, impact that your interventions can have. 
Do you feel that, and there's mention made, in, and certainly in your uh, submission, uh, Liz, sorry, uh, about a US study, and there's other evidence. Do you think enough has been made of that? Because, you know, I appreciate that third sector organisations come here and th they will say that funding's an issue, and that's the case. But whoever forms the administration here has pressures too, and if it can be persuaded that um, interventions can have a preventative implication, do you think there's enough been made of that, or is it understood enough? Even by, not sorry, if I may say, not just by politicians, but by general practitioners, because it would seem to me that if you're improving the well-being of someone, then you're reducing the likelihood that they're going to be medicated, um, and so on and so on. <clears throat> yes, quickly, I think that's, I think you're absolutely right to, you know, these are really important points. Um, the third sector has a, a bit of a problem in terms of evaluation, because robust evaluation is expensive. It costs money to evaluate services. It takes time. And sometimes, you know, even then, it's really difficult to prove attribution. Um, but we, uh, going back to the example um, that I put in our written submission about King Carden and Deeside befriending, for example, as a home from hospital service, that very small <clears throat> pilot service, you know, I think demonstrates that there is a considerable amount of money to be saved by, by the NHS if you can get... A, for example, a befriender to um, support someone to go home from hospital on a Friday instead of a Monday. That's three bed nights you've saved already right there. There's further evidence to indicate that having a befriender or some other person coming to the house um, prevents slips, trips and falls by elderly people, which is obviously another major um, stressor on the health services purse. And the reason that's that's the case is because somebody can actually physically escort somebody to the shops if that's what they need or down the garden path or just something as simple as reaching into a high cupboard to get a tin or changing a light bulb so all these tiny tiny little interventions can really um, save huge amounts of money the difficulty is to absolutely prove attribution um, and I think some befriending services certainly have been asked to you know jump through extraordinary hoops to prove that they've saved their local NHS X amount of pounds, and it's it's not that simple. I, I have to add on this. Uh, and, uh, and this side is particularly good at doing what the national, uh, uh, a national campaign could do, is to go out there and to show everybody. I remember them seeing in the shows, in the local shows, and we are really not only talking to older people, but talking to, to different generations and making... and understanding everybody that it's an issue who should, should, should be tackled. So again, the blueprint is very much in Aberdeenshire, the best place to live, maybe. Can we very briefly bring in Laura just now? We think there are two ways we can measure performance. We are launching a tool for frontline organisations um, uh, to help them measure whether they are reducing loneliness, because there aren't many usable tools, frankly, that don't make people cry, because they're very harsh often. Um, the other opportunity is that there's um, currently development of a Scottish longitudinal study on ageing, and we believe that that needs to include um, a recognised measure, um, a probably a more robust recognised measure of loneliness, like the Dion Geerveld scale. Um, and we'd say that those two opportunities um, are ones that we'd recommend, and we'd cer we'll certainly be taking up the measurement tool across the whole of the UK, including Scotland, because our frontline work does extend to Scotland as well. Um, do any members have any final, very brief questions they'd like to ask, John? Yes, thank you. I was hoping to give us a shot. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed the paper from uh, Laura's organisation, Campaign Tent Loneliness, and I was particularly interested, Sandra and I were talking about it earlier on, uh, about, a, kind of a, it was about the third paragraph in your report, uh, because it says there's relatively little data comparing levels of loneliness in urban and rural areas. Uh, then it says, admittedly, in England, Wales... Um, tends to show that high levels of loneliness can be found in urban deprived communities with lower levels in rural areas. And then later on it goes on to say uh, that while some areas of high deprivation are also of high risk of loneliness, there is no correlation overall between levels of deprivation and levels of loneliness. Could you just give us a short comment on that? Yes. <laughs> um... Think about it and maybe write into us about it. If I, th you feel I think it will be probably be a longer answer than. Right. Yes. Um, but we can certainly delve into that. Um, yeah, yes, I think it's better for a written answer. Yeah. Sandra? Okay. Jane, I just wanted to ask one question and um, I feel as though I'm being controversial today. That's, this is a kind of second controversial question. There are a number of groups, a great number of groups, who are doing a fantastic job. Do you see duplication? in anything 
that is being done. I mean, you talked about Liz talked about the befriending service. We had, um, you know, evidence last last week from Age Concern Scotland who are taking forward Silverline, which is an English-based charity, but the money is coming from the Scottish Government to Age Concern to Silverline, and we have other people here. And it's something I've often thought about. I could name right away ten organisations in my area in Glasgow, Kelvin, who do a phone befriending service. Is it something we should be looking at? Duplication, too many small groups or big groups all doing the same job. It may sound controversial, but the pot's only that size. I'd just like to know what you think about that. Sheila, can I ask you, because I know there's quite a few community transport services out there, maybe you could answer it from that point of view. I would say that the, the spread of community transport isn't totally across Scotland. and There are, I don't think, very many areas of duplication. We've been recently in a project in Sutherland. Uh, Scottish Ambulance Service wanted the groups there to work more closely together, but they're all very isolated from each other and all working in a very local area. Very, very few actually work beyond their local area. So I, I think that it may appear that there is duplication. The other thing that Annabel whispered to me just now was um, sometimes people want to use more than one service. <laughs> so you may find that... I know you're specifically talking about befriending, telephone befri befriending. All of you know, the yeah. organisations give a service, apart from I, I, a number I think that are dedicated. A, yeah, a lot of them want to use something on a Monday, something on a Tuesday, something on a Wednesday, rather than... And they will make the choice which ones they want to use. So I think it's very good that we have a lot of people doing the same or similar things. Um, they've all got the same end aim. And it, the ones that aren't successful will collapse. So, you know, it's it's market forces, really, in a way. Laura? I didn't whisper that. To you, by the way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Even more briefer. Um, research shows that, um, and this has been picked up really eloquently through case studies um, explained today, research shows that people are more likely to stay involved in a group if it's something they're interested in. And if you think about everything we're interested in around this table, you know, if we laid bare all of our interests outside of work, then they'll be run into the hundreds probably. So actually, to keep people connected, we think we need a great proliferation of activities and services. Services probably for more, more for those who are extremely lonely, but activities certainly. And I think duplication is probably not the best word to describe that. It's about um, joie de vivre and, and um, choice. Mm -hmm. Just very quickly, yes, I think that while it might seem that there are lots of, for example, befriending services, our experience, um, well, what we know is that there are befriending services not only for older people, but for people with disabilities, people, you know, cot death, dementia, there's a, whole, there's a whole spectrum. So when you look at the number of befriending services throughout Scotland, you think, gosh, that's quite a lot, including possibly some, you know, several in your constituency, you may find that they are for different, they're for different service, service groups. And um, they're probably all run on a shoestring. So there wouldn't, <laughs> there wouldn't necessarily be economies of scale in attempting to join these, you know, join these services together. Thank you very much. That ends um, agenda item two. Agenda item three is um, an item on witness expenses. In keeping with the usual practice, members are invited to delegate to me as convenient responsibility for arranging for the Scottish Parliament corporate body to pay under Rule 12.4.3 of the standing orders any expenses incurred by witnesses into our inquiry into race, ethnicity, ethnicity and employment. Do members agree? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place on the 23rd of April when we'll take evidence from Health and Social Work Services on our inquiry into age and social, social isolation. And can I thank every single one of the nine witnesses that came today for a fantastic input and evidence you have actually given us. It's all been very, very relevant. And I apologise for actually having to keep it pretty tight but thank you very much again we got a lot of information from you thank you and that ends the formal part of today's meeting thank you